Good afternoon, everyone, to all participants on today's webinar. This is uh, from ACAM Onsite. This is our continuing series of continuing education seminars and webinars. Welcome again to all participants. A uh, couple of uh, just notes before we start. Should you have any questions during the course of the webinar, we ask that you put those in the Q&A section of the Zoom meeting. And also, if you are attending this webinar and for credit, that we may, you make sure that when you registered, your information, correct name and email was on the registration so that you can receive your credits uh, correctly. So on those two notes, what I'd like to do is introduce our participants for today's continuing education webinar. My name is Doug Weinstein. I'm vice president of ACAM, and we are a management company based in Fort Lauderdale and managing luxury condominium properties from West Palm Beach all the way down to Miami Beach and Fisher Island. Joining me are two very esteemed colleagues concerning today's topic. Our first participant is Sinisa Kolar, who is the executive vice president of the Falcon Group, and he is based out of their Miami office. Uh, the Falcon Group has, and Sinisa has more than a decade of both international and domestic experience in all aspects of construction and engineering. He brings extensive talent to the Falcon team, working very closely with boards, contractors, attorneys, management companies, condominium associations, and also homeowner associations, uh, as well as architects and engineers. And he also guides the Falcon Group on Miami's staff development through identifying skills and needs and delegating tasks and motivating his staff for outstanding client service. Uh, Lisa McGill is a board certified in condominium and plan development law. She has counseled numerous condominium, cooperative, mobile home, and homeowners associations throughout Florida since 1996. Her work includes advice relative to all facets of community association operations, such as interpretation, amendment, and enforcement of governing documents, rulemaking, contract negotiations, and drafting. And of course, compliance with state and federal statutory and administrative requirements. Uh, she also is an expert in handling timeshares, mobile homes, collections, and foreclosures, and any other legal issues concerning condominium and homeowners associations. Thank you, Lisa and Anissa, for joining me in today's webinar. And let's get started with our presentation on 40-year recertification inspection and the associated processes. Sunisa, I turn it over to your uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, I just uh, want to say uh, good, it's already afternoon to all of us on the, on the panel, so-called, so and, and uh, to all the participants. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for taking the time uh, to, to chat with us, if I may say so, about uh, this process uh, for the year certification and uh, what, is it, what does it entail, who does it affect, and what do we do, do, what do, we do about it? Uh, Lisa, do you want to give a couple of introduction words? Sure, sure. Well, I want to thank ACAM for inviting me to participate. And it, I think it's great that we have these opportunities to share information with community association leaders and community association managers. So having the, um, the expertise on this panel is going to be greatly appreciated, hopefully, for the participants today. And I look forward to having a productive session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. So for all of you participating, please uh, use Q&A sec sec section of, of the Zoom to ask any questions. We'll try to answer as, ma as many of them as, as possibly uh, 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 we can. Uh, we'll you know, stop the presentation and answer anything that's important or uh, pertinent to that part of the presentation. And whatever we don't, we'll try to answer at the end. So let's, let's start with this. Uh, what is the 40-year the, the uh, restification? Basically, the 40-year restification is a process in which 
uh, we are trying to uh, verify, confirm that the building, the structure is safe for operation. Uh, basically means that the building is safe to be occupied. Uh, the certification includes a certification of structural systems and electrical systems. Uh, no other systems are presently part of these certifications, meaning plumbing, meaning uh, uh, mechanical and anything like that. So the focus on this system is on uh, electrical and structural. There is a reason for that, and that is that these two systems are uh, life safety systems, uh, not in a sense that uh, other systems are not, but from the perspective that if we neglect structural and electrical systems, we can cause structural damage and loss of life and property uh, uh, on, our, on, our, on our property. Uh, from structural, obviously things can collapse, uh, from electrical, uh, uh, we can cause a fire or electrical people. So from that, those two perspectives, that's why these are important. Uh, where, where does this, uh, where is this required? So uh, there are two counties uh, where this is required presently. Uh, one is the Broward County and one is uh, Miami-Dade County. Lisa, do you want to give us a little bit of history when and how? Yes, actually, I mean, there is a question already uh, mentioned on the on the panel for what is it required in Monroe County. Now, I've heard for years that other counties or other municipalities are considering similar programs, but I, as far as I know, none of the building department or uh, county governments, municipal governments, have really taken up that charge. The program started in back in, all the way back in the 70s in Miami-Dade County. And think about it, why, why is that? Well, where were the first concentration of high rises in Florida? Miami-Dade County, so it made sense. Broward followed suit in 2006 as the buildings in Broward started to age and the building officials noticed that there was deterioration that may not be maintained or handled in the appropriate way. So from, from that perspective, uh, in Miami-Dade County, what is required? This is the usual question that we get. Who needs this? Are every single building required to go over the 40-year restification? Uh, I, I may probably missed, I, although it's a self-explanatory, but I just wanted to make sure <laughs> sometimes uh, uh, names don't mean what we, we mean. 40-year means that this process starts when the building turns 40 years. So 40 year certification means that this process starts when the, when the building, the structure turns 40 years. Uh, and as it says here in Miami-Dade, that pertains to every single building that meets these requirements. Exemptions are that uh, for the buildings that are single family homes, duplexes, or have occupant load less than 10 or area less than 2000 square feet. Now, very important thing, as I said, this is a life uh, safety verification of the property. It is not a code compliance check, meaning this is not where you check whether your building meets current code. However, Miami-Dade does have two things that they want as part of this process to be verified from that perspective and if not uh, uh, properly done to be prepared to meet today's code. One of those things is parking garage uh, and, and parking and garage lighting, they require that to be conforming to today's codes, as well as for, uh, for Miami-Dade County, unincorporated Miami-Dade County, they require that parking lot guardrails uh, are present every time the property lines abut the, the, uh, some body of water. So if you have a canal next to the property, you have something like that, and you don't have any parking barriers, the uh, unincorporated Miami-Dade will basically make you uh, uh, do that. So those are the only two things that are uh, required from a code compliance thing. We'll talk about code compliance in a broader sense as a result of this process, but as a general request of this process, the only purpose of this is to basically um, maintain your property and keep your property safe for occupancy. In Broward County, rules are a little bit different, uh, very similar. The, the structure has to be 3,500 square feet, uh, and then they exclude uh, some government buildings, school buildings, and so on and so forth. 
uh, you can you can check the whole list of exclusions. Uh, the Broward County on their website, if you search, you can find the the access from codes, from statutes, and you can see how uh, uh, what are the the actual forms and all of that. Same can be done for Miami Dade uh, uh, in their forms, the notices, and also these letters that they will be. Uh, uh, presenting. I'm just running over this. This is something that is relatively easy to to search and, and find on. But on you've raised two. You've raised two different issues that I think people need to or need to be reiterated. It's called a 40 year inspection. It's actually called the building safety inspection program. So you explained what the purpose of the program is. But 40 years is just your first. Uh, uh, experience with the program. After the 40 year recertification, you are required to engage in a certification every 10 years thereafter. That's 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 a one important thing that you did mention. And again, uh, most in the industry, I, I, it seems that only the condos or high rises or co-ops feel that they are are governed by this program and required to comply with the program, but HOAs and other types of properties have several buildings that could be larger than 2,000 or 3,500 square feet. I mean, many of our clubhouses are, are 5,000, 7,000, 8,000 square feet. They may be somewhat newer buildings, so you don't have to face the program for a few years or several years, but it's, it's not a program solely for condos and co-ops and it's not solely for residential properties. So you already mentioned that. So yeah. Also yeah. one of the things that we get asked all the time because of our market is Palm Beach County. And there have been you know talk of Palm Beach County adopting a similar ordinance or rule and I think what will happen is as those buildings in Palm Beach County, particularly the high rise condominium associations age, that this might be something that down the future you're going to see in Palm Beach County as well. Doug, I could, I could not agree more. And that's something that we constantly hear and have questions uh, and, and very important uh, uh, to, for people to understand what, what Lisa just said, and that's a, a safety inspection program. No matter what county you are in, you should be following this program. Just because it's mandatory in Miami-Dade and Broward, uh, uh, it basically this program follows the simple mantra, do you maintain your property? Uh, Doug Weinstein, one of the panelists here, said something that I, I definitely want to steal from him. And he says, uh, you start preparing uh, for 40 years the day you occupy your property, the day you occupy your building. And that it couldn't be said is a simpler, simple truth about a, a 40 year. Basically, it means as long as you maintain your building, as long as you keep your property maintained, the 40, 50, 60 or 70 year inspection process is nothing but a simple paperwork to be filled out. The, the problems with this process start because we don't maintain the property. So uh, what does this entail? What is the, uh, uh, what do we need to do? So as I said, it includes structural and electrical. You can see here some of the uh, uh, things that are included, but basically what is, the, what is the procedure? The procedure includes inspection and the report. The inspection is mostly visual, vis, vis, uh, visual in nature, uh, does include destructive if necessary and determined by the inspecting uh, party. Uh, it pertains to the entire property. So whatever is encompassed, engulfed by your property, it's part of the fourth year. If the dogs are on the same folio number, they are included. If the seawalls are on the same folio number, they are included. Basically every part of your property structure-wise is included in this, in this process. Now, one of our one of the uh, attendees asked whether the roof is included in the structural, and I think you've already answered that. The answer is yes. Correct. Uh, it but, is. Uh, this is a confusing issue because I remember in Miami Dade, this is not that many years ago, where the deck of a restaurant they had just completed their forty year inspection, but then the deck completely collapsed, and it was discovered that the deck was not included in their inspection for some reason. Correct, and that's why I, I, it's important to know where the boundaries of your property uh, is. The deck part of your property, adjacent property, 
uh, so to know what should be included in this policy year. Uh, uh, and forget for a moment about the administrative process, why are we doing this, to fulfill some need or some requirement by the county or by the city to just, you know, fill the paperwork. This process is way more important than just that. We are doing this to protect the property. More important than anything is the dock collapse or something else collapsed. This is basically how this process started. The fourth year started because something collapsed because it wasn't maintained. So the Miami-Dade County first and the Broward County later on said, well, it seems like we cannot let, leave it to people unattended to verify that the structures are maintained. So we'll come in at four years and just double check whether people are doing what they're supposed to be. And it's not only a trust issue. Now, many building operators don't have the expertise that is necessary to know what types of proactive maintenance is required or the best, uh, the best protocols for maintenance or the best way to accomplish a specific project. If you um, have a great management company on board that has very much expertise in well, high rise, low rise, whatever type of building construction, you're gonna be way ahead of the game. But this is why um, I believe that an architect or an engineer must perform the inspection as opposed to a contractor or some other type of professional. Yeah, you're right, Lisa, 100%. And uh, you will hear a lot during this conversation, maintenance. Uh, 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 the, the, there is a very strong connection between the maintenance and the four-year process. And, and Doug, as, as somebody who represents associations, as many associations and day-to-day -day operations, definitely uh, a resource in, in that sense as to how to maintain the property so you don't get into the 40 year uh, problem that becomes a capital improvement project. Right, what we find unfortunately in a lot of instances, uh, you know, is, and I, ha I hate using the, the term, but it is apropos deferred maintenance. We see that on a lot in associations and particularly when it comes to the structural end of the spectrum. You know, and things such as, you know, we are in a very corrosive environment in South Florida, both from a natural corrosion of the saline, from the salt, from the atmosphere, from the ocean, from the rivers, with anything. But also, you don't understand, too, is that we're, we're in a corrosive atmosphere, I hate to say this, for storms and hurricanes. So anything that's left unattended when it comes to a structural element of a building and can it, and it is not corrected, just can open up so much more issues. And as Sinise has said, you do please maintain your building because it does start when that building opens and you don't wanna face your 40 year with an incredible list of objects and corrections that could have been avoided. Thank you, thank you, Doug, you're right 100%. So the, the next step in the process after the inspection is the report. And these reports are relatively templated or standardized when it comes to, when it comes to the, the process. You can see here that basically they, they this is the sample of Miami-Dade reports, they seem to be a, a relatively simple checklist. Uh, simple from a perspective of how they're filled, not simple in terms of what information goes in. But the point is they're checklists. So your inspector is going to go around your property and he's going to, he or she is going to populate this uh, particular uh, uh, report to the city. It's going to have basic information and at the end it's going to have a, uh, a grade, passing or failing. If you pass the report, you're done for the next 10 years. If you fail, then you need to go and do the, re the, the repair. The submittal... Uh, Sunisa, we have a question on the Q&A. Um... Yes. Is, the, is it the same requirement for reporting and inspection on each 10 year interval after the initial 40? Correct, correct. Nothing, there is no different format of the report. There are no different requirements. After 40 year, the 50 year report is exactly the same. The process is exactly the same as for the four year and every 10 years after that. So there is no change in requirements of the program after the 40 year. 
There's also a question here about how, about the 40 year certification help in the property valuation. I can tell you that buyers are becoming far more savvy when it comes to looking at some of the building maintenance protocols, asking to see whether the 40 year inspection was done, asking to see what repairs or or corrective work was necessitated as a result of the inspection and the failure to comply with the program could impact your marketability because the lenders are going to be uh, concerned whether the work has been done or hasn't been done or you're no longer in compliance with the requirements of the uh, the applicable building uh, code. So it's something the the valuation if you if you fail to have the required work performed, it's going to negatively impact your value. It's also, it could also lessen the security or the livability and comfortableness of the residents there as to the structural integrity of the building and their personal safety. Right. So, uh, it, it, after we are done with our report, we need to provide a submittal to the city. Basically, that submittal includes the, the two reports, one electrical and one uh, 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 structural. They are delivered to the, to the county, to the city. And uh, uh, basically, if you have a passing grade, you, you are done. If you pass the 40 year, uh, you are done. If you didn't, then there is a process that follows. After the submittal, if there is deficiencies, now you have to perform the repairs that are requested. Uh, uh, then that usually requires you applying for a permit, selecting a contractor, and then doing the repairs. This is where you will have to comply with the code because you may not need to comply with the code as a request of the 40 year, but every time you do the repair, that repair is the one that is going to uh, 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 have to be done in accordance with the current code. And that's where most of the times we have bigger problems. There was a question, and I'm going to answer a couple of questions that, that were posted on Q&A. Are the contents of individual uh, apartments included? Yes, they are, from obviously structural and electrical perspective. So inspectors will be checking for your outlets, for your panel boards, for things like that, on the on the uh, on the structural side, we'll be checking for cracking, for the issues on the balconies, for structural problems. So, uh, uh, Sinisa, is there is there a representative sampling that you do on the interior of the building, i.e., apartments or dwelling units, depending upon the actual total number of units? So this is the thing. This is absolutely up to the uh, uh, engineer or architect providing the report. As I said, this pertains to the entire property. Uh, us as engineers, it is up to us to determine the necessary sample based on the condition of the building that would satisfy that requirement that we can safely say that the entire property is either certified or not certified. Obviously, it's much easier to make that judgment once you know there are problems on the property, once you say the property is not in the condition to be certified, then repairs uh, have to, you know, be commenced. The much difficult time is once you have to uh, certify property as safe, how much of those units do you need to inspect to confirm that? On an average, uh, uh, numbers go between 20 to 50% of the units. They can go up to 100% of the units inspected, depending on obviously size of the property and conditions observed in the property. Well, this is where associations really can get into trouble. And this is really where you can help yourselves by planning in ahead proactive actions to put yourselves in the position to uh, have remedies or have enforcement techniques if you need to, number one, gain access to units. I mean, if you need access to 50% of the units, do you already have keys on file? Do you already have policies requiring those access rights? And 
there were questions asked about the interior of the unit. I mean, the electrical is included in the interior. Windows, obviously, are uh, included in units. So having a clear understanding of who is responsible for what maintenance of, maintenance of what components is important, number one. Number two, having the right as an association to perform corrective work in the event an um, owner fails to do things so is important. Right, Doug? I mean, Doug, you, you must have experienced where owners give you um, are reluctant to re perform the repairs that are necessary for the building to obtain recertification. And the association is still on the hook. It doesn't matter if it's an owner responsibility right. or an association responsibility. As, as far as the building code is, the building officials are concerned, they want to know that the building is safe. They don't want to know about your internal disputes as to whether, you know, so-and-so did right. an illegal modification and so-and-so never replaced their windows. So, I mean, how do you deal with that from a, from a on the ground stand, Doug? Well, I think it's important to note that that basically what you need to do is is one of the things that there's we break it down into a couple of things. It is access, as you well mentioned, it can be an issue, uh, which there again are documentary uh, provisions for that as well as legal if you have to go, hopefully not down that far to do that. Uh, but we also you have to be very cognizant of the fact that this goes to the point of you need to maintain and you need to control what people do in their units as opposed as it respects renovations and work. And one of the things that people don't realize is that modifications in a unit can affect your 40 year certification and your 40 year recertification rather, whether they've done something to a panel, whether they've moved a panel when it shouldn't have been moved whether they've overloaded circuits by putting an incredible amount of uh, appliance outlets or other things. We see a lot now where you're doing, people are doing tankless hot water heaters and they're putting in high usage things such as dryers. That has to be looked at from a global standpoint in an association with your eye towards your 40 year certification. As again, we can't really stress enough that this is an ongoing process. It's not just sit back and then wait for, you know, the 39th year, 364th day when things have to be looked at. It's all a continuing matrix going forward every minute of the day the property operates. That's so important. I mean, one of our questions was, what should a condo association do in advance to understand what may be flagged? I mean, even searching for open permits. I mean, if unit owners have performed work and they never got the finals on their permits, you could be very, very diligent and make sure that the contractors are licensed and make sure you get insurance certificates. But again, not that you want to be um, everyone's parent, but the point being, if you have these open permits, it may not impact the rating on the forms that are submitted to the building official, but you have to apply for more permits to do right. corrective well, work. So that could that's gonna put you back. And then and then also funding issues. I mean, again, um, if you're not collecting reserves and your your budget is very tight, you want to make sure that you have the authority as a board of directors to levy special assessments without any vote of the membership. While it's very rare that membership votes are required for maintenance items, sometimes we do see it. And we're talking about buildings that are 40 years old. So if the documents are 40 years old, it's more likely you're going to see some impediments to levying special assessments, you may even have impediments to obtaining financing. Those are things that you could all kind of tackle now, regardless of how old your building is, so that when the time comes, you have those options available. And also just to tie into the mantra of, of don't waiting, not waiting for the last minute. One of the things that we recommend to our boards when they're faced getting into that time frame to face their their certifi their recertification inspections is to have is to retain the engineering firm to do also to do part of it to do a pre inspection. Okay, that's one of the things that we find is very important. Have them come out, look at the building, and do a pre inspection to give the building and the association and its board a heads up as to what number one could be tagged in the recertification report so that things can be handled and done 
before that report has to be submitted so that you're getting, quote unquote, a clean report. It's, it's very important that you do that. And it's something we stress to our clients. And that's why I, I mentioned the type of report you're getting is type of part of the 40 year. It's a templated report. What Doug is mentioning is something that for all intents and purposes, we can call a pre 40 year inspection report, which basically gives you rather than what's wrong uh, uh, and you failed, it's telling you this is what you need to fix in order to pass. It's a different type of right. report and you should be careful when you are potentially closing, uh, you know, getting closer to, 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 to getting the 40 year done and you're selecting engineers or architects, ask them the right questions. If you ask them for a 40 year report, they're going to give you this templated report, which is not going to give you much information rather than you have failed. If you ask them, hey, I want you to look at the property from a perspective of what I need to do, how much is going to cost me to fix all this broken so I can pass the 40 year, you're going to get a different type of a report. More expensive, granted, but something that you, you, you are going to have a value. Remember, the 40 year is the purpose of that particular report is for the city, not for you. You are not the recipient of that report. The city is the recipient of the report. City is going and to come what, back. Yeah. Uh, well, that's something to think about when you enter into the contract with the engineer or the architect that you select to perform the inspection. I mean, in my opinion, it's it's more it's absolutely crucial to have the engineer prepare the specifications for the repair for you and also to engage in contract administration to oversee or at least check the work being performed by the contractor help you evaluate the contractor bids so that at the end of the project you are actually have a building or final product that conforms and is what you paid for so uh, uh... Let's just uh, uh, see if we can, you know, answer a couple of these more questions. And I think by going through this, we're gonna get to some of these things that Lisa and Doug were mentioning. Uh, and, and some questions are pertaining to the actual process, how long and who does what. So in, in this process, there are three parties. There's the municipality, there is the licensed professional, and there's the owner. The municipality has basically two tasks, to send you a notification and to send you the violation notice if you don't do it. Basically, that's it. The city has no, the municipality, the county, they have no other uh, uh, involvement in this process. They are not going to verify engineer findings. They're not going to tell the engineer or architect, this is what you have to do. This is how much of the property you have to inspect. They're not going to make any of those requests or confirmations. The only thing they're going to do is basically send you a letter saying you're due. And then if you fail the inspection, they're gonna say, now I have to fix it. That's about it. They don't go inspect the property. They don't verify whether the engineer was right or wrong. They just take basically the engineer report at a face value and go with it. Lisa, let me ask you a question as for what Sinisa was just saying for the municipality, which we get a lot of times as well. When can, and in your experience, the municipalities in Broward may be different than Miami-Dade. Uh, when a building, a building will sometimes ask, well, when, when are we gonna get that letter? When are we gonna get that? And, and what if we don't get it? And we, and we know we're, we're at the 40 year or you know, the 50 or the 60. You know, what is the association's culpability or you know, if they don't get something, does that obviously we don't believe that obfuscates their requirement to file the report? Yeah, I agree with you. Um, there's a little bit of a difference of an opinion on that, but the county sends a list of the buildings that are reaching their 40 year threshold to the municipality or the various town uh, building departments, building officials. If it's in the county, the county will handle it itself. And some of course cities and towns are far more on top of this process than others. Um, while you may not necessarily have to submit the report if you haven't received your letter because the letter really does trigger your compliance requirement. 
you still want to be cognizant of the of the years because you don't want to be year 45 year year 46 and all of a sudden uh, have have an issue that's going to preclude sales in the building and people are going to be asking for the 40 year certification or financing and, um, and 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 the issuance of other permits so so your your compliance requirements are triggered when you receive the letter but you can't necessarily rely on the city to always to do the right thing. There's also the issue with properties that have several buildings. It's 40 year certification of that particular building. So you have seven buildings, each one completed in a different year. You're gonna be going through this process for the years in which those buildings um, age out. And that's something that you can also kind of plan for as well. And I think now, one of the things as, just to rem well, as far as timing, I mean, there are a bunch of questions about timing. And Cindy said, why don't you tell uh, the, our attendees about the timing for, for safety type stuff as opposed to emergency type stuff and what have you. So yeah, let, let's just uh, finish this. So the engineer is basically gonna do the inspections and, and pro provide a report. And the owner is basically gonna submit that report to the city and then perform the repairs. When I say owner is gonna perform the repairs, Owner is gonna, you know, make appropriate steps so those so those repairs are performed. The timeline, and this is a, a lot of questions have come uh, regarding this. So basically, the notice is issued at 40 years and every 10 years after that. Now, very important distinction: if you get a notice at 40 years, but you finish your repairs and you get the report that says you passed the 40 year at year 45 you are gonna get the second letter, the fifth year letter at year 50. You're not gonna get it at year 55. The 10 years start, the time starts ticking from the day you get a letter, not from the day you get to a compliance, which means even if you don't get the letter and you get a letter at 42, the city may still issue the, the letter at year 50, right. not at year 52. It, this is a, a very important so you can understand the dynamic. So you're going to get a letter at year 40 and then every 10 years after that, irrelevant of when you complete your uh, 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 report. So once you get the report, you have uh, uh, 90 days to uh, uh, basically uh, complete the report. Whether it's pass or fail, it's irrelevant. You have 90 days to produce a report to the city, to the uh, municipality, stating whether you are uh, uh, passing or failing this particular uh, uh, report. 180 days after that report is what you have to finish the repair. Now, this is the this is the one that we get a lot. So, 180 days uh, that's not enough. Usually, it's not enough. Depending on the type of the problem and type of the project you need to uh, 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 go, it's not enough. But the city and the municipality have no expectation that you're going to be finishing this in 180 days. They want to see an effort in you moving along with your project, and they'll give you an extension. It's important to know that that's at their discretion. There is nothing in the book saying that they have to give it to you. But our experience is that every time you're making a progress, you get an extension. For buildings, it's very important because uh, if you are going to go and have a major restoration project, you need to have first specifications. You need to have the drawings because you have to permit all of this. In order to permit the repairs, you need an engineer to provide a set of drawings for that. Now, according to your condo bylaws and uh, Florida statutes, you now have to go through a competitive bidding process. You need to select your contractor. You need to have a contract negotiations where your attorneys and your management is going to work with you to have that and then you have to apply for a permit. That entire process can eat all 180 days. So basically you're working 180 days in resolving this, but you still didn't, you still didn't fix anything on the building. As long as you show to the city, to municipality, you're doing something, they are going to give you the extension. Their goal is to have your building be safe, not to collect money on violations and citations. Right. So that's, that's very important. Two things, as I said, you have here, most of the time, the permits are required. This is very important. Uh, people usually think, oh, I have some concrete problems. I just have somebody 
my maintenance team is going to patch it up and we are good. Structural work, electrical work, 99.9% .9 of the time require permits, which means you're going to need an engineer, you're going to need a detail, you're going to need a permit set of drawings, you're going to need to go to the city. So you have to take that into consideration. 40 year, you're getting a report. If you fail, it's not as simple as just have somebody with a box of cement and or a bag of cement and fixing things on the building. So take that into consideration. And these are some important notes that empirically we have witnessed. And uh, you know, both Doug and Lisa, please uh, comment on this. Uh, first question is something that, that co commonly comes is how much is the city involved? And I told you, city is not involved. Basically you're passing or failing the content of your report is exclusively the opinion of the engineer or the architect, which means three different engineers, you can have three completely different opinions, three completely different scopes of work. So the, the law is written in such a way that the person certifying has the authority in determining what is that, what's required and to determine based on its own opinion, the condition of the property. So be very careful when you're selecting an engineer or an architect, because choosing the engineer and architect can make a huge difference between the amount of work you'll be doing on the property. I actually just answered a question raised by one of the attendees on that exact issue. I mean, again, when you're hiring the engineer or the architecture firm, you have to know that they're capable of doing the entire inspection. It's structural and electrical. Do they have engineers or professionals with both of those expertise? Uh, what's going to be the scope of the contract with the engineer? You want to, of course, ensure that they're, the engineer that you hire or engineer firm that you hire is going to perform all of the inspection and pr prepare the report that's required by the particular county in which you are located. And then we talked about some of the additional work that's done after the report is submitted. If, um, you know, if uh, for some reason, you know, your building does require repair, do you want the initial contract to have phases or options for you to be able to go forward with the specifications, bidding, contract administration? Do you want to, you know, address that issue when the time comes, you know, how do you want to handle some of those types of issues? So it's important when selecting an engineer is very, very important because you want to know that you're assured that you have a professional who is going to have the best interests of all of the residents, all of the owners in mind and uh, not uh, necessarily um, succumb to uh, pressure by various individuals to perform less of an inspection that may be otherwise necessary. Hey, this is a great question. If you don't like the report of the engineer, can you hire a second one to get a different report? Now, let me just preface that by saying there was also a comment beforehand where the engineering report said that the required, the windows required caulking, but the way that their building was constructed, the windows had weep holes, or I guess it was windows or whatever it was had weep holes. So not engineers are not infallible. Uh, uh, can you address both of those issues? So I mean, what if the engineer makes a mistake, number one, and you know, can you use another engineer? Hence my comment, be very careful about choosing engineer. Be, I mean, listen, I'm not telling you something you don't know. Be careful about hiring anybody in your life, whether it's an engineer or anybody else. Uh, you know, even when you want to hire somebody to, I don't know, clean your house, you still go and vet out three people to find out, you know, what are the references and whatnot. And, and so same, if not more diligent, you should be about hiring your engineer. Uh, uh, and just to tie into that, Sinisa, one of the things that, you know, kind of slips through the cracks a lot and, and you have to be cognizant of it. We're very, you know, diligent when you hire, we hire a contractor, a concrete contractor, or a seawall contractor or whatever, you know, to look at their insurance and make sure they have proper levels, things such as that, carriers. One of the things that you also have to realize when hiring a professional, the same thing applies because there is professional liability and errors and omissions policies that professionals 
ready, you know, licensed architects and engineers have. So when selecting an engineer or an architect, you also want to look at that same criteria that you would use for a contractor dealing with their insurance. 100%, 100% right. And, and, and bear in mind that uh, uh, the, the report that, that the engineer is going to provide, uh, 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 you know, is based off of engineer's experience and knowledge on these type of matters. So you, you want to check for that. Uh, the, the engineers are the ones that are prescribing the work for the contractors. You know, that's why I say what your engineer does, it determines how much it is going to cost you. You, you, you. People often think, well, this is a $5 million project because contractor made it $5 million project. Most of the time it's not. It's a $5 million project because engineer made it $5 million. Contractor just does what the engineer tells him to. That's the, that's the key distinction here. So you be very careful about selecting your engineer to make sure that you hire a person or an entity that provides necessary repairs to comply with a fourth year, if that's the goal. Because you can have people on both sides of the spectrum. Like Lisa said, under the pressure of the board or somebody, let's just sign the building is great. And you know nothing is wrong. And then dock collapses and somebody gets injured or something like that, and then we have a much bigger problem. Or the engineer that just is not uns unsure of the property and then says, well, you know, we have to demo the whole property just because I have a crack here. So you have to find a right partner for this particular process. Now, what do you do if you have, you don't like the engineer's report, you want to go for a second one? You have absolute right to do so. Just bear in mind, if you already submit the report to the city, you may have problem explaining, or the engineers may have a problem explaining to the city why there are two different reports. So if engineer completes the report, you submit the report to the city, and then you have somebody else do the same report and have completely different findings, you might have a bigger problem later on. Now, if you don't submit the report, then you know it's entirely up to you what you're gonna submit to the city because ultimately you, you submit the report to the city. However, bear in mind that under engineering uh, license laws, the responsibility of the engineer is to the public safety, not to you as the client, but to the general public safety, which means if the engineer found a life safety issue in your property and you decide not to act on it and you find somebody else who doesn't wanna, you know, doesn't wanna put that in the report for whatever reason, the engineer may still have, may, may still have obligation to report such thing, such violation to the municipality, irrelevant whether you submit a fourth year or not, because ultimately it's a life safety issue. So that's very important. And I understand that you're saying, well, I'm paying the engineer, I don't want him to, I don't want him to submit that. The problem is that by law, the engineer has the ultimate responsibility not to you as a paying, a paying entity, but to the public safety. So as such, any type of issue that is a clear life safety issues might be reported to the, to the municipality, irre irrelevant of your fourth year process. I think, Sinisa, one of the things that's on the current slide that people don't realize that re you really need to stress is that you have to issue a follow-up report in terms of if there are conditions outlined in the initial report that need remediation or need repair or need some sort of attention or work, you then have to file a, another report that these have been corrected. That's absolutely right, Doug. And, and that's one of the big problems. And I, you know, I've, it happened to me in the past. Uh, so you know, some of these questions are basically empirical uh, because I've lived them. Uh, uh, first, as I said, the report that goes to the city is a templated report. So sometimes the people that hire us, they get that report and they say, fine, I failed. I know that. Now, can I use this report to go and fix it? No, you can't. Because that report does not have the details, the specifications, the magnitude, the repair protocols, nothing. It just has 
that you have cracks, you have falling concrete, you have problems with caulking, problems with roof, and that's it. It doesn't tell you how to fix it. It doesn't tell you where to fix it. Or it, it, it may tell you where, but may not tell you all the locations. The point is that that just tells you it's a first step in the process. And if you maintain your property, it may be the last step. But if you don't, after that, the next step is, okay, now let's have a repair protocol. So you have to hire an engineer again to do that part. Now let's build it out. Now let's do the supervision of the process. After we are done with all of that, now the city still doesn't know that you fixed all the 40 year problem. So you need to write another report to the city saying, hey, we fixed everything, we're good. Now some people ask, okay, I hired an engineer number one to do the inspection. We failed. Well, I don't like engineer number one, he's too expensive. I'll hire engineer number two to do the repairs. Fine, no problem with that. But now you go to engineer number one and say, hey, we finished everything, write us a letter. The engineer number one is gonna tell you, I don't know what you've done. I haven't been to the property since my original inspection. So I have to do another inspection to verify that everything that you have done complies with what I want to do. And then what can happen is maybe you did everything right and he's gonna sign off. You're gonna pay for that again. Or maybe your engineer number two or constant number two didn't do everything that the engineer number one needed to be done. So that means that now you're gonna have more repairs and you're gonna be like, wait, 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 why am I having this? So that's why you have to be very careful about this process. I'm telling you this because I've been in these situations where people think one thing and something completely diff different is happening. So this is for you to understand that there are multiple moving pieces. Hence, why you should maintain the property. The, the, if you maintain the property and you do all of this, then we don't have this discussion. Most of the time, it's just a walk through the property, everything looks good, let's sign on it, passing grade and you move on with your life. And that, that, that actually follows one of the questions that was uh, was raised by the attendees. It's saying if you're proactively making the needed inspections, repairs, upgrades, well, you know, what do we need the architectural, the engineering firm for? You only need them for the inspection and the report will come out clean and then they'll provide you with a clean report. You can submit it to the city and then move on from there. That's exactly our, right. I mean, our, as you know, we, we hope and again, I, I can't stress enough preventative maintenance and getting a handle on things as they happen during those years leading up to the 40 year. We had a, uh, one of the questions, Sinisa, that really goes down to a, a technical question that we get asked a lot, and it has to do with the electrical uh, end of the 40 year and the 50s and what the recertifications. Recently, particularly in South Florida, there's been some issues where developers, when they built the building 40 years ago, put in certain uh, equipment, certain uh, brands that have now become an issue with problems with that. And it particularly happens with electrical. Like if you have a certain, there's been some like manufacturers that have been deemed their boxes or their switch gear or whatever has been shown to have issues how is that treated in the electrical portion? And, and let's use it the electrical as an example. How is that treated in, in your certification of that? Uh, that's an excellent uh, question, Doug. And, and that's a, a, a huge point of uh, contention or, or, or discussions amongst the properties and the engineers. The bottom line is, uh, that there are certain brands, specifically when we talk about uh, 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 panel boards, uh, there is certain brands that have a known uh, history of uh, circuit, uh, 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 you know, short circuits and, and fires and, and failures. And uh, we've taken the position for most part that because this is a life safety and there is a known failure of the system, that this system presents a liability to the safety of the building and as such would have to be replaced. Again, this is a position of my office. 
I'm not saying that that's everybody's position, uh, but that's why I'm telling you that the the uh, position is taken by each individual engineer. And you may have an engineer going to say, no, no, I, I'm perfectly happy with those systems and we're not going to you know, touch them, which is, again, fine with them. Our position is that this is a major life safety issue and as such cannot be just overlooked. On the other hand, on the other hand, is, uh, for example, a railing issue. We have a lot of condominiums that have railings that have, let's say, six inch gap between their pickets. And they're saying, do I have to replace all the railings? Our position on that subject is that those railings were allowed at the time they were installed. Code has changed since, but because this is not a code compliance project, we have no right to you know, request that you have to replace all the railings from your building just because they don't meet today's code. The problem with panels is not that they don't meet the code. It's problem is that they fail. If we know that the railings are gonna fall out of its place and fall down the building, we will definitely require replacement. So in this particular- I think you bring up, you bring up a, go a good point as you just commented. And one of the things that associations need to recognize is that yes, there are certain things that are gonna be what we use the term grandfathered in, in when you talk about building components. But you brought up a very good point in that if the engineer in the 40, 50, 60 comes up with an issue where it is a life safety, and I'll use your example just now, where you said they've, they've, they've said that the railings are in severely deteriorated condition and have to be removed or have to be replaced, then that obviously, and you just want to let people remind people, that then triggers the code issue. Correct. So that when you're replacing them, they need to be replaced to meet current code. You can't say we're replacing them, but since the, they were originally put in in 1975, that's the code we're going to follow. That, that's exactly right. So, but, you know, remember, it's up to the engineer or an architect to prescribe whatever that particular engineer architect feels is meeting the requirements. It's a very loose, to a certain extent, interpretation of the requirements of this particular process. Uh, uh, and that's why going back to selection of uh, uh, entity is gonna help you with this process is, is critical. They have to look for your best interest, but also the interest of public safety. This is one of those things where you have to find a middle, not to you know, easiest thing in the world is to say, well, you have to build a new building because, you know, it doesn't meet today's code, but that's not what we are going for. If that was the case, then we would probably require every single window in the building to be replaced because they don't probably meet today's code either, but we don't do that. Some, for some reason, railing seems to be a big issue uh, on, on every building, but in reality, there are so many other things on the buildings that don't meet today's codes, yet we don't make a big deal about them. The problem right. is, once you touch something that is supposedly grandfathered in, most likely it will not be grandfathered in for the repair. A but lot only for the portion of the repair that needs to be made or because there are triggers to upgrade the entire component. Co correct, correct. And that's, that's where the cities are gonna be heavily involved uh, and their interpretation. We have, we have uh, seen different municipalities saying, if you're gonna replace, if you, if you have to remove the railing from one balcony, that you have only to replace that one balcony, not the entire building. So uh, it becomes a little bit of, a, then becomes an aesthetic issue, then becomes other issues. I know somebody asked a question about the balustrades. Can we replace the balustrades with balustrades today? Yeah, yes, you can. There is no reason for you not to be able to replace the balustrades. You can do, go and put the same concrete balustrades on the balcony if you want to, there's nothing wrong with it, as long as as long as long you're able to do so in such a way they don't become a safety issue. If there's a six inch gap and you replace, replace one of them, then you are okay to do that. But if you're gonna replace 90% 90, 90 of them on a balcony, 
you're probably going to have to put them in a four inch spacing, which is going to then create a completely different problem on your particular balcony. And that raises another issue too, because the fact that you need to make improvements in order to comply with the safety requirements does not necessarily obviate the need to have a membership vote to approve material alterations. Now, for if you're only doing one balcony area, obviously you have to do so with the balcony that is compliant with code. But that doesn't mean if you have the concrete balustrades that you're already you're automatically entitled to go with the aluminum pickets, or you're automatically entitled to go with the glass the glass railing. So that's something that you really need to talk to your council about because there are other improvements that may need to be made that do not require a membership vote like parking lot illumination. If the um, area in which you live says you need to have X amount of lumens and you're only now at Y amount of lumens, if you have to add additional lights or improve or upgrade the lights, the existing lights, well, that would be something that would be, that would not require a membership vote. But there are things that do require membership votes. So you have to really be cognizant of the distinctions between them. Yeah, I just want to answer one Lisa, question. Lisa, let me ask a, a question in general from a legal standpoint. Uh, you know, un unfortunately, we hope we never hear this from a, an association or whatever is what legally, what happens if an association ignores the 40 year certification? Well, I mean, obviously, the different municipalities have different fines, different penalties. But at the end of the day, uh, if you fail to do anything, you could be reported to the Unsafe Structures Board, and they could actually condemn, basically condemn the building, require everyone to relocate. So that's obviously a very extreme remedy, but it's not one that is unheard of. It's happened. And, and not just that. Now, the, uh, the, the, the point, Sinisa, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'll follow up. Sorry, sorry to, to interrupt, just, uh, 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 and they don't have to condemn the whole building. They can, they can condemn the balconies and basically lock everybody out of the balconies and say, oh, you cannot use the balconies, you cannot use the pool deck, you cannot use the garage. So they can basically condemn the part of the structure and say, well, until you resolve this, you're not going to be able to use it. So in that sense, the city, the municipality has very, you know, broad uh, 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 authority in terms of how they can enforce this. Now, Lisa, another legal question uh, that was one of the questions uh, on that is obviously, you know, once the, 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 the 40 year, 50, 60, whatever report is done, that becomes a record of the association. And I assume it would then fall under the all of the association record keeping regulations, mm -hmm. such as posting to the website if a building is over the hundred, you know. It applies with that, or if someone requests it as a records request, or or it, it, one of the particular questions was, it, it, should it be made available to prospective buyers? Well, you're absolutely right. It's an official record and it's subject to inspection by any of the unit owners or their representatives. So in connection with sales, if there is a request from the real estate agent for the buyer or from the buyer themselves that goes directly to the association, I would generally recommend that the CAM or whoever um, is responsible for that process notify the seller and tell the seller it's their obligation to provide that report to the buyer because it really is not the association's obligation to disclose the report. But I've, I've been in situations where the, the seller or the seller's uh, real estate agent is really being uncooperative. And I've said, hey, listen, if you don't release the report, then you know we're going to release it. There, there's somewhat some trepidation associated with that because you don't want to be the catalyst for the contract to, to fall apart. But again, you want to be honest with your, uh, well, your residents, your owners, and this is a prospective resident, and really it's the seller's obligation. You're not you're not required to undertake the seller obligations, but in my mind, I, I really hammer and, and encourage the seller to do the right thing. Okay, great. Also, Sunisa, I had one uh, one of the other questions on the on the Q and A, which I don't think we addressed, which I think it, 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 for a lot of our associations could be very pertinent, and the question was is the seawall, if a property has a seawall, is that considered part of the 40 year, 50, 60, et cetera? 
It is. It is. As I said, everything is part of the property. We had example of the dock, uh, you know, collapsing. So basically, docks, sea walls, uh, any any you know additional structures you have on the property, such as clubhouse, entry gate houses, mm -hmm. fence walls, anything that is structure wise that can collapse and cause a loss of property or, or loss of life is something that definitely needs to be included in the report. Great. And remember, we're talking about code compliance, we're talking about compliance with building regulations. But remember, for the most part, this, these are your homes. I mean, you want your home to be safe, and you want to safeguard the other residents. I mean, as a, as a community association leader, you have that fiduciary obligation anyway. And well, I haven't seen this, um, uh, I haven't seen any adverse rulings yet with this the statute does say for condos that if you abrogate full completely abrogate your responsibilities and there are injuries as a result then you could possibly be held personally liable so you you want to do the right thing for yourself you want to do the right thing for your residents your owners and you want to do the right thing to comply with your fiduciary obligations very very important lisa very uh, i think at this point um, Sinisa, any final thoughts or, or suggestions to associations? Well, uh, I just want to say thank you to all the participants, to you, Doug and Lisa, and, and for having this. And if, if, if uh, our participants can, can take one thing from this, uh, uh, and that is, well, like you said, you prepare for 40 year, uh, uh, the day you occupy the property. The maintenance is the key to this. If you maintain your property, 40 year is nothing more than a somebody checking paper and sending to the city. If you don't, if you let your city, uh, your, your, your property uh, be neglected, you're looking at an expensive and lengthy and project with probably a lot of aggravation. So if I can recommend something, do not defer maintain, maintenance, make sure that you maintain your property, make sure that you, you keep property up to date and you have no problem with this process. Lisa, some final legal uh, advice for our uh, participants. Well, of course, preventative maintenance and ongoing maintenance and reserving for expected maintenance, very, very crucial to community association operations. But from my perspective on the legal side, you may wanna do some corporate housekeeping. When I say that, look, at your documents or have your counsel look at your documents to see if there's any impediments for you to obtain funds for various projects or you know can you modify the documents to give the board a little bit of flexibility when it comes to making changes or alterations do you have impediments to obtaining loans and what are you going to do if the owner the delineation of a repair of responsibility is that of the owner but you have a an owner that is unwilling or unable to to um, fulfill their obligations. How are you gonna address that? What's your timing on that? What can you do in advance to give yourself effective enforcement techniques? Great, and also one of the things that I always ask, and I know there probably is no answer to this, but anytime when we're dealing with a regulatory issue, I always ask our experts, uh, if, is there anything that they see as potential revisions or changes to these 40, 50, and 60 year certifications. We get we get asked once in a while is, you know, and Sinisa, you brought it up in the beginning of your, your presentation, is it doesn't include, you know, mechanical and plumbing. Is, is there anything that coming up in the future that you, you guys are hearing about on boots on the ground, whether it be legislatively or Sinisa in, in terms of, you know, professionally, any changes or any further things that are going to at some point be included or is it just status quo for this time uh from what from what my experience tells me uh um if anything cities are going to make this process more stringent if anything i think that they are probably going to try to include more and more stuff in the 40-year process uh, maybe even you know change it all together to some other type of process, but safety inspections are gonna remain, probably including more things. I, I've heard the rumors some time ago uh, that they are definitely thinking about mandating either window uh, to be impact resistant or to have, you know, uh, shutters on the windows as a, as a you know, throughout. Uh, you, you can see that ELSS 
is uh, engineering life safety systems is something that's being pushed uh, 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 and it's being you know postponed every year but at some point you know it's going to be mandatory uh, so there is a, a, a strong push i think in the in the at least on the legal side and on the uh, county and, and buildings uh, side to make this process uh, more stringent to ensure safety of, of everybody there's a lot of construction a lot of buildings and, and i think that cities they don't want the the the, the liability don't, don't want to have problems right. lisa anything that you're hearing or that we should be aware of from your end or legislatively Legislatively, I mean, there's a dichotomy between the building professionals and legislators. Remember, legislators have to answer to their constituents, which are all of us Florida residents. Uh, building officials have, or especially if they're licensees, engineers and the like, have other obligations and um, ethical responsibilities. So there's that little bit of that struggle because we're in somewhat of an anti-regulation type legislative mantra and that's one of the reasons why the ELSS requirements have been kicked down the, uh, the can kick down the road a little bit every single year but at some point it's, it's, it's just going to take one tragedy for not only for mm -hmm. this, this program to expand to other areas of the state and for them to add additional components into the inspection process. All right. I think one of those of us that, that mm. right th those of us that come from the northeast are very familiar with that uh, knee-jerk reaction, unfortunately, to, to things that happen within buildings. Uh, at this point, I want to say thank you so much to our uh, panelists, Sanisa and Lisa. I think it has been an incredible amount of useful information for associations, board members, and managers. Uh, I would, as a closing comment from my end, I think I would just echo uh, what Lisa and Sanisa said is that it is the most important thing as an association and managing agent is to maintain your building. And it's not just what's required on the 40 year certification. It's anything from, you know, a small leak developing to something happening within a unit or anything that requires attention. You should do it then because unfortunately in our profession and in the what the structures that we're dealing with Something small now can lead to something very, very big and potentially hazardous if, it, it, hazardous if it's not remedied. So I think if anything is taken away from today is that, again, maintain your building, maintain your structure and maintain the components. Don't be surprised. Don't let yourselves be surprised with a bad 40 year report and the costs associated with the repairs. If you've been doing it all along, then it is basically going to be a lot better for you both financially and physically. Uh, again, I would like to thank all the participants. Uh, once again, if you are uh, involved in this webinar for credit to make sure that your registration information was correct. Uh, on the screen now, you will see the contact information for all of us. If we can be a resource to any associations, managers, uh, board members, please feel free to contact any of us. And with that being said, I thank you for your attendance, and we look forward to the next uh, in our continuing education series. Thank you all, and a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.